Today's podcast is brought to you by Bert's Hair Tonic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I am recording this, so this is where all the good stuff comes from. Welcome to the You Can't Handle the Emet podcast. My name is Nicholas Ingle, and I'm the host of your show. I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for 13 years at the time of recording the show. And the whole point, the idea, our mission is to bring you ordinary, amazing people living ordinary, extraordinary, and amazing lives, just surviving incredible challenges. And that's the point of doing this for you is to make sure to help you, our listener, understand and learn from those who are also surviving. My guest today is an amazing young doctor who I was fortunate enough to meet at my gym and... Uh, Figured if you can survive our training, you can survive anything. Benji Rosen is a doctor based in the UK, and he's kind been kind enough to come onto the show to talk about the work that he's doing, and also a Benji shows a Facebook group um, that you started to develop a little bit of awareness uh, as to the the people behind COVID nineteen, called the humans of COVID nineteen. So Benji, I uh, want to chat to you about that because that had a profound effect on me. Um, just been watching the posts and seeing the the humanity behind what's going on and the the real heroism and, and sacrifice of those on the front line. Uh, Benji, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Awesome. Right. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a rundown on your background? Let's talk about, you know, um, your multiple. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to say it. The Jewish James Bond. <laughs> multiple languages, skiing, mountain climbing, doctor, musician, uh, author. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, Heart, uh, heartbreaker, heartbreaker. You caused a lot of Jewish women, a lot of stress in my gym because you were not on the market. <laughs> Yes, they, they invited me to all those Friday nights. And then suddenly all those invitations were rescinded when they found that I was... Uh, <laughs> That's how it <laughs> works. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I might have cost you some business. I'm very sorry. Yeah, it's um, okay. It was, it, it, was, it was worth it. <laughs> all right, dude. So, yeah. Um, I don't know about James Bond. Yeah. Um, but I, I grew up in Switzerland, which was um, incredibly lucky. And I don't think I knew how lucky I was um because i i did get to learn to snowboard and learn lots of languages and um and go to an amazing school and i always um wanted to do history at school and um, okay. i loved history and i loved the stories and and um uh, you know big moments in history and I, I i applied for university of history originally right um but then i spent some time in the army so i'm 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 pretty i'm, I'm quite um Useful with a gun as well, I suppose. Yeah, Dane, but James Bond, there we go. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm, not, I'm not really helping this case for myself, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, in the army, I was in the medical corps and became a sergeant in the, the medical corps and a, a trained um, army paramedic. Um, and as a result, I just fell in love with medicine and, and uh, went on this 10 years of um, essentially getting the right grades, exam after exam, seeing patients, uh, being an anatomy instructor, um, fighting my way through medical school, but having an amazing time at the same time. Um, right. and, and now here I am on, on the front line um, on, you know, what's been now a, what feels like, I'm not sure, since March, this long slog, this four month slog of um, COVID and and working with some of my favorite people around me, um, doing my best to to get through it and get overcome this adversity. Um, and in some ways, I feel I feel lucky that um, I made that choice um, because even though everything was very difficult at the moment, I, I love being a doctor and I I feel very um, very privileged to be able to do this work on the front line and and um, actually be involved and do something about it. It must be very stressful not being able to do anything about it and just sitting back and hoping it doesn't affect you. Whereas at least every day I get to do something, which is something I feel very, um, very blessed to be able to do. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the humans of COVID-19. It's uh, sure. 
each and every post is poignant um, and and hits home. And, and and there's been a few that have really that have really gotten to me. Um, there was a female police officer who spoke about the challenges of having to make a decision of does she go back to her family, you know, to to keep them safe because she's isolating, or does she, you know, how does she isolate? And then there was a young, I think, a young nurse who was just saying like what what was so hard for her was seeing how the 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 doctors were wiped out and that that's the thing i got from a lot of the younger guys that that have written on this group it's about seeing and get almost a, a shock as to how the senior guys have been hit and wiped out the the senior medical staff um and the workload that that everyone is having to carry because it's it's overwhelming of course i, th I think that's that's been one of the most difficult things about um, about the pandemic. I think most of the time, you've always got this feeling in medicine that there's probably someone out there. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty, and yes, cases are difficult. There's probably someone out there who's got the answer, and I just haven't asked the right expert yet, or I haven't asked my boss yet. And okay. look, these consultants who usually know all the answers, and suddenly we have this new disease where actually the data wasn't there, so there were no answers. Um, sure. That's an extremely uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation to be in. Um, I th so I, to go back to, to, to humans of COVID, um, I, it's sort of, I guess, considering that I wanted to do history, I suppose it, it naturally sort of happened. Um, right. I found it very frustrating that we were there, you know, working, working extremely hard while there were still lots of people online. Um, and people I knew who, who weren't taking it seriously enough was still visiting family and, and girlfriends and things. And, and I felt um, very frustrated and, and sorry because I, I was worried that they were all going to get, get COVID and I care about them. And so I thought rather than me being the angry ranty medic, that I would do something creative and useful. Right, okay. And I feel that the world is now full of emotion rather than rationality. Yes. And that I, if I could create something that was slightly emotional, um, if I could interview all these amazing people I was surrounded by anyway, and have them tell their story, and then perhaps if that connected with people, they would think of the people on the front line and, and who this affects if we get a second wave. If we get a second peak, we're the first to go down. I, I got COVID. Most of my colleagues got COVID, and it was awful. Um, and our, our antibodies wear off, probably. <laughs> who knows? Right. Um, so we'd we'd get it again, and slash. There's lots of us who haven't. Um, so so and, the and stories. Yeah, I mean, there's also your families that you go. Home to, you know. That's what that police officer was talking about. I mean, it. She she was. I mean, interviewing her was 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 extraordinary because she. It took about a month to put together because she had to get clearance from her and from from her police station to do it. And we, and find a time we were both on night shift at the same time to meet up to, to, right. to sit at a distance and talk. Um, and it sounded like she had been through absolute hell um, because, not because COVID was scary and not because policing was scary or any of the things that she was used to. It was just making that decision. And I've seen that in a lot of my interviews. It's very, very difficult when you give people the decision between their job and their family. Um, which is something I think we all experience a little bit every day anyway. Yes. But for her, yeah. it really, really erupted because her husband was, was shielding. And she felt that if she kept going as a police officer, she could give him coronavirus and he could, he could possibly die. So, so what do you do? And they desperately needed her in the police station and she loved working and being useful. And at the time, he was telling her as well, you should keep working. Right. Um, sure. And she was so tall. And that's that's a very very emotional and difficult and uh, and quite difficult to interview as well because I found I got quite emotional interviewing her as well actually. Um, but she found a way through, and I, I think that's the that's been a pattern as well that I see all the time with these interviews. That these that's I think that's what that's what people mean when they talk about the the extraordinary strength or or dare I say it, heroism of the mm. people who are on the front line at the moment, is that they are finding ways through. They are finding a way to make it work. Um, 
and they're going into these battles and coming out the other side and they're coming out so strong that they're even willing to talk about it with me which is obscene right. yeah um i can't believe she she was being uncomfortable enough to talk to this stranger about this horrible time that she had and, this, um, and, and, and stuff that's funny. deeply personal yeah so that spe that speaks to you as well my friend because uh, you are easy to talk to you're a good kind gentle soul young man i do my best yeah um i think i think the trick is i don't do a lot of talking to be honest mm. i just i and i love i love how at work as a doctor i often just because i don't have much time and because i have so many patients to see so quickly i i don't I, I sort of very gently, perhaps not interrupt, but I, I make sounds to make sure that a sentence finishes so I can ask the next bit of vital information I need uh, right. because the, the bit about someone's um, other parts of their story aren't necessarily relevant and I have to be a certain speed to help them as well. And the pleasure of this project as well is I can just say, is there anything you'd like to talk about? And then I can sit there for half an hour um, yeah. and take it all in and actually really feel someone's story properly which is really special it, it's been yeah absolutely um are there any are there any particular people that have stood out for you i remember you asked me did i read the one about the bus driver you know and, and i think it's just to to let people i mean everyone needs to check it out on facebook i mean humans it's humans of covid 19 um that you know it's not it's doctors it's nurses it's police it's bus drivers it are uh, the one gentleman who was the security guard uh with all the tattoos you know that was like <laughs> absolutely what you know yeah you know what i'm talking yeah. you know these, these are just it's like maybe becoming a doctor or a policeman you understand you're going to put yourself on the front line but for the security guard the bus driver. I mean, these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Mm. I don't think they expect it to. Um, it definitely, the bus driver definitely stood out for me. Um, and she got in touch via Facebook. Um, right. Which was something I was, I was hoping would happen. So as I started interviewing my colleagues at work, I then started getting lots of messages online from people who wanted an interview in mm -hmm. all over the UK. And I've now had a couple of international requests as well. Um, oh, brilliant. And these, these are very um, special people who really want to, want to share. And she, she um, had this incredible story to tell that in, again, it was, it was so, it's very much uh, um, the Emmet podcast style, an ordinary person doing extraordinary things and how her job is still the same, but is still driving the bus. It's just that she's seen this, this special side and she's been she's so much more appreciated and she's she's suddenly become a lifeline out of nowhere from being right. a just a, a regular driving her bus she she's become a lifeline to this whole community um because of covid because they're locked um and she's their only way out um and i, oh. I found that incredibly special and she um was really sweet about it and and uh loved being interviewed um I've also, the other ones that have stood out for me is often, I have to admit, I, I often interview and think, goodness, I, I could have given that interview. I feel exactly the same. Right. And I've, I felt that way too. Um, there's been a lot of people who talk about their dad and how, how their dad has, mm. they've seen their dad and their patient. Yes. Um, and they think of their dad, which has been, again, something I experienced very strongly. Right. Um, during the worst of the pandemic, because um, my dad is the same age and and also doesn't have lots of healthcare conditions like so many of our patients. And I just thought, you know, it could be him. And I kept thinking it could be him. Um, another one that really, really stood out for me um, is, is the, I think I recently actually, just a couple of days ago, published one about a gentleman talking about how He's an ITU doctor about how much he hates breaking bad news. Right. Um, and I've got quite a few of those coming, but it's really, really difficult. And he, he was talking about how he had to call the brother and tell him on the phone the bad news. And I've had I've also had a 
um, a, a lady from Scotland who was talking about how she called her sister and told her sister her granddad had died. And I think these conversations are just, just not appropriate on the phone. It's just completely inappropriate. And I, I do, I, I do it all the time now. And it's just, it's just so heart wrenching because you, you can't put a hand out and put it on someone's arm. You can't, you can't offer them a tissue. You can't, you can't look at them in a certain way to give them a warning when it's coming. You have to say something to warn them that it's coming, but that's awful too because you don't know, uh, mm -hmm. you don't know who they're with. You try and figure it out, but if you start asking too much, they know it's awful. Um, there's so many layers to that that's very difficult. So, I guess the uh, the answer to your question is that the ones that stood out for me have been the ones that, unsurprisingly, are the ones that I've I've probably done the same thing and felt the same way. Okay, and that makes it a lot easier to write them because I know exactly how they feel. What, what, you, what are the doctors going through? What are you guys going through? Is that something that you'd be comfortable to share? I think, I think there's a lot of mixed emotions. Um, on the one hand, I, I think we're, we're grateful to be involved and there's been a lot of the time I feel I've never been more um, grateful and, and proud to be a doctor and and especially working in A&E I I'm surrounded by all these inspiring people and I I feel that because of how bad things got um, everyone sort of switched mindset and it was like you know it felt like I was back in the army a lot of the time and we were all just goal oriented and, and working hard and getting it done. Well, I think uh, um, Ben is amazing to be a part of. Right. Like a you. Ted, okay, um, so you, you broke up there for um, a second. Sorry. sorry. Um, I I felt that um, there's there's been some positive moments and experiences I always take out of this that we've we've had to work as a team really closely. I've never felt closer to the team that I'm in. Um, we've we've also we've we've rolled on, so I'm, I'm working my job longer than I would have. I would have been working in a &E for four months, I'm now working there for eight months. So okay. I've gotten to know that we, you know, enjoy working with the nurses and, and doctors that I'm, I'm stuck with, per se, um, okay. which has been really, really, really nice. Yeah. Um, and I've been very lucky. I and, love that. And it feels like we've all been, you know, um, in this, we've been in this bad situation together. And because we've come through and been inspired, we understand each other more, and we've seen each other at our at our worst and at our best, and we've we've we formed quite a bond that I think wouldn't have been possible. I've never experienced before in my career. Right. Um, on the other hand, um, at at the worst of times, it's been it's been extremely extremely taxing, and I I think you can see that on a lot. Of, certainly, I feel that, but I feel that a lot of my colleagues and I've had a lot of conversations with with a lot of my colleagues recently as well, where they're exhausted and just emotionally exhausted. Right. And you can see in how we're negotiating for various things for our patients, often completely nothing to do with COVID, just the same stressful things that we would do anytime, anyway. Um, and for for some patient, a, being a doctor is inherently frustrating sometimes. But I don't think we're coping with them as well at the moment. I think it's just the cumulative stress and, and emotion of everything that's happened. Um, I, I remember the first when I'd been away for two or three days and then I was going to come back on a shift. And in those two or three days, lockdown had been announced. Um, it was all, you know, the numbers had shot up. I'd been seeing texts from work that there was lots of COVID going on. And yes, we've been treating COVID already, but I knew things were going to be worse at work. Right. And I, I remember pacing outside, um, not getting in the car, just because if I got in the car, it would mean I'd go to work. I'd go into... I was pacing outside, you know, tearing up, feeling really, really stressed. And, and then obviously, I, I, it helped. <laughs> I, got, I got in the car. Yeah. I went to work. I felt better having had that moment. Um but it was extremely, extremely stressful. And it was very hard to explain every evening coming back. Um, and all you could do is talk to colleagues and just make sure that they were okay and, 
because they kind of understood. Um, right. Whereas it was very hard to explain to family just how it. The other thing that that was very hard to explain was that even on the days when it wasn't so tough, um, it was that overarching, and still in some ways is that overarching feeling in your gut that it's going to get worse. And you've got those pictures of Italy, and you've got those those you know those thoughts in your head. You look around, and you think this is bad, but we've been told it's going to get worse. Right. And that never went away. Even as things got started getting better, we thought well, this is just a blip. It's going to get right. worse. Right. Uh, and that plays on you, and that that really sticks and keeps you thinking about COVID when you get home, when you're in bed, when you're trying to sleep, when you get up in the mm. morning. You're still get you got that feeling in your gut and that you're still thinking it could the next moment could be worse than the last right i mean that's how how are you guys coping with it how what are you doing or are you doing anything can you do anything is anything being done um other than training with us um, yeah so training with you has been great awesome. um <laughs> that's made a huge difference so about twice a week we've been uh we've been doing these sessions for, for <laughs> and um i i been even before the training sessions i was doing a lot of runs and and an awful lot of push-ups and i just feel like i'm sharper and i'm more emotionally um emotionally uh full of fortitude if i've had some um if i've had some some recent sports training or some level of fitness even if it's a small amount right. that makes a huge difference and, and my emotions thing I'm also, um, I also feel very strongly that the, whenever I've had a big problem in my life, I have felt better about it by doing something about it. Okay. Um, I always feel better about something if I'm doing something. That's why I'm endlessly doing stuff. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> sort of totally selfish because I want to contribute. And as long as I'm working yeah. on the problem, the problem isn't so bad. Right. Um, yeah. So in many ways, that's what Humans of COVID has been for me. It's, you know, I, I, I interview about twice a day when I have a day off. I'm editing constantly because people give me these interviews, but they're about 45 minutes long. And then I, I've only got 340 words. So I spend an awful lot of time sort of reading sentences, picking and choosing. Right. Um, and I feel like I'm contributing. I'm doing something. There's about 70,000 people who read the stories every week. So I am hopefully making a small impact with it. So it feels it feels good to make some kind of difference, and I f I feel better about the problem because I'm working yeah. with the problem. Yeah, something about it which helps. Um, so even if in a small way, I think if 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 someone's worried and and feeling very stressed and struggling to cope, um, even if in a small way contributing, whether that's at work, sort of making sure that there's a regular session where people talk about their feelings or okay. Um, contributing by charity or volunteering or whatever it is i've certainly found that extremely helpful um i also kept a diary that made a huge difference okay so I, I just just by writing down it was difficult each day and, and what what i'd seen each day made me feel better about it because it was sort of gone it was off my chest it was on a sheet of paper somewhere which was right. better um and also talking to friends and, and and i think i've been very lucky to have lots of friends who work in medicine that I can tell these stories to and and um, share the load with to be honest and I've noticed that for a lot of people who I interview for humans of COVID I get the feeling that some of them don't have that and that somehow with the interview I've sort of become that and that's okay and I'm happy to do it um, but and they've often said how much they feel better having talked about it to someone who understands who's right. been through it and I think mm. everyone needs to find that they need to find that that buddy or that series of buddies who are who are there when you need to have that phone call in the middle of the night or when something's awful happening or whatever it is. Mm. That's so important. So I'd say it's 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 find a buddy, do something about it, um, write it down, um, and just like I don't know, take time and be honest and explain explain to other people how you're feeling. And I, that's made a huge difference to me. Sure, that's amazing. I mean, that's uh, those are four very practical things that people can do, and uh, that's yeah. I think I think 
it's such a big thing in, in terms of explaining to people how you're feeling and, and not assuming people know what you're going through and just being honest. Um, it was a lesson I learned very early on when I stopped drinking, going to being invited to a wedding or a birthday or any function. And even a wedding, um, I would explain to the hosts, the bride and groom to say, listen, guys, I've just stopped drinking. And, uh, but this was even three or four years into my recovery. And, you know, if I'm not feeling comfortable, please understand. It's not you guys. It's me. I'm going home, you know, and, um, I can't stay and no one had a problem with it. And the first couple of times I was terrified, but no one, they're like, for sure, man, thank you. We value you being here for as long as, as, as you're comfortable to be here. And that just comes from the value of sharing what we're going through. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's always, it always seems harder before you start talking about it. You imagine all these worst case scenarios that what someone, what someone might say, or if they're, if they're going to be, um, I don't know if, if, especially as you know, are you, because you've got emotions, are you now burdening them? Are they going to feel worse hearing your story? Mm. But in my experience, it's never turned out that way. Actually, people are usually quite touched that you feel comfortable enough to be honest with them. To talk and, to them yeah. um, especially in, yeah. And if you've got something also, what you, what you talk about is almost always going to be something they've, they've not experienced and, and would, would probably be quite interested in anyway. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have many friends. I feel very lucky to have you as a friend, as a um, as a recovered alcoholic, um, yeah. and I've learned so much from you. And the strength oh, that thank you've you. had has been very inspiring. Um, and so I've always been been not just um, open to and and more than happy to to talk to you if you ever wanted to. Um, yeah. But but it's not something that feels a burden at all. It's it's I think it's important to share and learn from. Thank you. Uh... Dude, that means a lot, man. Thank you. If you, I suppose this is a, this is a question I've been mulling over in my mind since we've been talking, um, you know, whether, whether it's, it's, whether I should say, you know, ask it in terms of saying to people, listen, is there anything you would like to say to people um, on your behalf and, you know, to the public on your behalf and on the behalf of those who you share the front line with that, uh, you know, in like take this seriously and, and behave yourselves or, you know, it's because for me, what I find frustrating is you know, there, there's a lot of flippancy around this and for whatever reason, but the reality is when people get sick, you and the rest of the people on the front line have to deal with it, you know, and someone who could have stayed home and survived is going out, getting sick, and then you're having to make that phone call. So I think uh, I, uh, I had um, Andrea Magni on the show earlier, uh, amazing lady, ex-South African, South African from in Boston. And she said, great advice that her mother gave her was, don't focus on your own belly button. Um, you know, we're also focused on our own belly buttons. We don't see the world around us. And maybe people need to be less focused on their belly button. And... Uh, mm -hmm more focused on, you know, the consequences of their own actions. I think that's something people are challenged with. It's, it's been, I'm going to share something with you now because um, yeah, you're interviewing me now. <laughs> it's something that's been absolutely heartbreaking for me to witness is on social media and why I took myself off social media to a large extent, how the South Africans are, moaning and complaining and are angry and bitter and putting all of their energy into cigarettes and alcohol. And it just had me thinking, okay, you smoke. That's cool. It's uncomfortable if you, if you run out of cigarettes, you, you, you're not allowed to drink anymore. If you, if you can't drink, then it's a problem and be aware that it's a problem. Stop being so focused and angry about this and the money that you're saving, help your neighbor feed his family because he can't now. You know, that, that blew me away where people are spending, and I'm talking, you know, sort of, 
I don't want to say like more affluent people, people who could afford it, people that I'm interacting with on, on social media that were moaning right. about cigarettes and alcohol, but were not putting in any effort to use that money elsewhere to help other people who desperately needed it. Because a man or a woman who has lost their job and can't keep a roof over their heads, because we're seeing a lot of that now, a lot of the rental markets, houses are being taken off uh, the rental market and they're up for sale. And there's been a huge amount of damage to the economy and people are, are focused so much on their own belly button, their own cigarettes and alcohol, that they're not going, hmm, okay, I can't spend this money on my habit. Where else can I spend it? That'll add value to people. And, and, and that's sort of what, maybe that's sort of, again, why, why your, the, your group that you started has hit me. So it, it's hit me hard. It's like, I don't, I don't pause and take a breath before I read comments on Facebook, except from yours, because I, I, there's raw emotion and honesty in it. And I think for me, that's the most important thing is the raw emotion, um, sorry, the raw honesty because that's what I choose to live my life with. Mm. And uh, you're good at this, dude. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, you, if there's anything that you'd want to, just from your experience, just share with people. Any advice? I don't want to call it advice or a statement or stay home, you dumb. <laughs> I think. I, I know, I know you know how to use a Barrett M50, so. <laughs> yeah. That's a um, the, uh, I, I, I feel similar things about how sometimes um, people are struggling with social distancing and, and everything in this country as well. Um, I feel a lot of what you're saying about, about South Africa. And certainly having spent six weeks in, in Johannesburg, um, in Baraguana, st uh, stitching up people who came in um, blackout drunk and have mm. clearly been in a horrible fight. I mean, it's just, there's so many reasons why alcohol is having a really horrible effect, <laughs> especially on Soweto. Um, and it's, it's frustrating that that's, the, that's been the response rather than, oh dear, this, this virus is such a disaster and all these people are dying. Although I suppose, considering how many people were dying because of the alcohol, it, 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 perhaps it's a similar reaction. Right. I think, I think one of the things that I found very helpful, um, and that I would definitely want to share with general public more and more, if I could, is Please. that this is, this is not an election. So in an election, sometimes people feel like their vote doesn't count. And, and I think that's wrong. Every vote does count. Obviously, it's an election. Um, but... They, um, but it feels like it doesn't because it's just one person puts in a slip and then you're one of millions of people there making a decision and really how much impact do you have? But this is not an election. This is, this is, a, this is a virus with an exponential R number. So that R number being three means that it's, it's even, even if it was just two, um, the R number means that that's not how many people just you in fact, that's how many people the next person in fact. So you're exponentially increasing the number of people getting this virus by your actions. It's not right. just one man, one vote. It's one man, one exponential damage. And that's, that's the powerful, scary thing about this virus that makes it so, so different. And a, a new concept that we've not really had to think about before. And so, definitely look beyond your own belly button because that that one belly button behaving badly um if you behave if if you go and and see your girlfriend anyway or or see your family anyway um or go and, and have a big party in, in the woods with lots of friends and and do lots of things um that's that's you might think it's just you but it's not you're exponentially creating a wave and when you look back to how this first wave kicked off, you can see there's these epicenters of people who went to uh, a religious service anyway, even though they were told they should be socially distancing, or you see people at certain conferences, or you see these sort of collections of people who thought, well, this doesn't really matter, it doesn't really affect us, and then it exponentially blows up. 
so perhaps it's it's natural that I would pull back to the science um, but I would say think think of us on the front line and think of the exponential impact you're having even just in one interaction because you could be carrying this without knowing right and you passing it on and and then that creates a chain that that ends up with hundreds of thousands of people and that's so tragic and i really hope that that we all despite the fact it's been going on for so long find a way and find that inner strength to just carry on being being safe and and taking care of each other and being safe for each other right and uh, you know as you, this is not an election as you said and it's like you're not a politician and and that's what you know there is no, you, there is no vested interest that you have other than the well-being of your community and your colleagues and other people on the front line that, that's sure and that hits me here and i can see that on 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 your face you know it's like this is the seriousness of it it's yeah it, it it's it, it's anyone misbehaving and i'll use that term increases the potential for exponential number of phone calls that young doctors are going to have to make to family and no one actually deserves and whether whatever your chosen profession is you don't have you don't deserve to have to have anything more than necessary and i think this is the the issue with the 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 infections that we're facing it's 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 unnecessary you know it, if just by behaving well and following very simple rules I, I understand how difficult it is to follow those rules um look okay, I mean, it's, it's real human we're just start trying our best and that's what i'm asking for is that, that everyone tries their yeah. best um, that, yeah and i think there's a lot of and especially and one of the one of the most heartwarming and wonderful things about this whole situation has been all the incredible financial donations to mm. the well-being things for doctors and nurses all the so not just the money raised but also behaviors there's been this, my street had this amazing um weekly clap for carers which was was really a pleasure to to see and very touching i i think i think all of the these things show how much people care about us um, right. but there's but there's only one thing that we ever really asked for there's the only one thing that we really wanted and it was these just to do anything that every, every we just wanted everyone to do everything still want everyone to do everything they can in their power um to help us and the only real way to help us the main thing we need is is these i don't think they are that simple i think they're quite difficult but but yeah. following these rules for months and months mm. um is 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 much much harder than clapping for us and sending us money and yeah. is much much more important um sure. and that's that's all that's, i think when you dig down to it you ask someone on the front line that's what we're really asking Okay. So if there's one thing that people will take away from this is to do that, you know, do as much as you can to be as careful as you can. And, you know, for the gift that I have of my recovery and the gift that I have of being an alcoholic is the understanding that your life can change completely in an instant if you decide it's in your best interest and you want it. So my entire life revolved around drinking alcohol. Uh, my social group, my friends, my work, how I lived was alcohol-based. And when I stopped drinking, I couldn't go to the pub at night. I couldn't hang out with certain of my friends. I couldn't go to certain family functions. Um, I had to then sit at home with nothing to do. Oddly enough, I started doing a push-up, and the one push-up killed me, and we started building it from there. But we can understand that we have the ability and the power to change our lives completely and our behavior completely and it for our own good and for the good of those that we care about so it is something that is doable because if you look at anyone who's successful in recovery or any new form of living um you know it, it's doable so that's uh that's the message i'm going to try and, and work with this the show today you know, as one is your, those awesome pieces of advice, which I love, 
you know, the writing it down, verbalizing it to yourself is fantastic. Getting a buddy, you know, sharing it. And, and that's, again, recovery, you know, you're going to meetings, realizing you're not alone and we're not alone in what we're going through. And, uh, but then also just be understanding that every time you go out without a mask, you don't socially distance, you don't sanitize your hands, you, you run a risk of, of exponentially spreading this thing. Yeah. And it's, it's classic. I've, I've noticed also a pattern that it's, it's us chaps. It's the men who mm. don't, who don't do the talking and who don't, um, who are so often, um, feel that it's, it's almost, it's better to just keep it all in. And it was men's health week last week, actually. Um, right. and I was thinking about this a lot, about how, how I've been so touched by so many men coming forward who want to talk about it. Um, and who felt better by talking about how they feel and who also are, are so passionate about, um, social distancing and fighting this virus and not sort of being the sort of the, the classic, um, stereotypical, frustratingly macho young man sort of saying nothing can hurt me. I'm untouchable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's very tempting to feel that you're as, as a young man, very untouchable and, and, um, uh, invincible because we 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 can jump further than ever before we do all these push-ups we can do all these things and yet i'm in recess in a and e and there's a young man with who can't breathe and i'm thinking i'm actually you know only a few years younger than him that could right. definitely be. um and i bet he felt invincible too and and that's very difficult to watch but also a really important reminder that it, it's it's so important and i think if anything, especially as this virus affects men more than it does women, it's it's even more important that we we make sure that, um, that just like anyone else, that we we are honest with ourselves as men, and we we make sure that we not just follow these rules, but also take care of ourselves. Awesome, Benji. I just you know I want to say thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, I know downtime for you is very limited. And, you know, you, you talking to us means you're not sleeping or doing something for yourself, you know, going for a run or, you know, and uh, I'm very, very grateful for that. It, it, it means, it means the world to me, man. And just what you shared is so valuable on so many levels from the perspective of what you're doing with your, uh, with this amazing group to your, your advice and also your you know, your, 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 your challenges and the difficulties that you shared. I mean, it's not, I'm sure. I, to do a job where you, to do a job with passion and commitment where you may end up having to call a family member, you know, to give them bad news. It's just, yeah, you, you have, you and all of your colleagues and just everyone on that front line have my, just my utmost respect. I don't have the, the, capacity the ability to actually voice it so i'm just saying you know thank you man it's, it's unbelievable and it, it doesn't mean in any way shape or form that i will be taking it easier on you or advising the coaches in any way <laughs> but thank you dude you, you're a proper rock star Here you are the jewish james bond <laughs> Thanks, Nick. It's obsessed. Thank you. Oh, and, awesome. you know, it's fine. I, I, uh, I find it incredibly helpful to feel stronger and fitter than ever before. Excellent, excellent. The the biggest challenge that you faced ever, and I'm going to leave this part in the show, is, um, you know, for not even dealing with COVID or dealing with any of these, the military or any of these things. It's, I think the biggest challenge that you still face is getting Viv to do more than two sessions. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And look at that, I'm out of focus already. So I guess it's the end of the show. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, where's that stop recording? All right, I'm just going to stop the recording. So, Ben, I just want to say thank you again, man. It was wonderful. Pleasure, pleasure. It's a pleasure to be on the show and to talk to you in general. Awesome. And yeah, the, the focus came and went. Never mind. Yeah, it's like weird. It's like, where I know, I know I'm supposed to lock it. Listen, I'm learning. <laughs>